Good evening and welcome to this third Guild Institute on Christian Family Studies lecture. I'm Charles Bacaris, Vice President of Advancement for HBU, and I'm honored to be with you all this evening. Uh, I want to say thank you to uh, Gary for his wonderful convocation remarks this morning. I know our students enjoyed it. It was a, a full house, and uh, I think your message was extremely well received. So thank you for being with us this morning to speak to our HBU family then, and we look forward to your comments here in just a few moments. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, our guild president, Ms. Ann Roper. Ann and her husband have had a long association with HBU, and it's been a blessing to have them a part of our family for sure. Following uh, Ann's remarks, our president, Dr. Robert Sloan, will, uh, will also be up here. So let me now turn the program over to uh, Guild President Ann Roper. Ann? Will you pray with me, please? Almighty God, we invite you in to this room, Lord. We welcome you here. I come tonight, Lord, with uh, a grateful heart First of all, Lord, I just thank you so much that you, uh, our creator God, that we can call you Father and that you love us like you do. Father, I thank you for uh, the privilege of working with a group of women who love the Lord and who support Christian family values. I thank you, Lord, for our president of HBU, Robert Sloan, and and his leadership, Lord, and that HPU is uh, founded on Jesus Christ, Lord. Their foundation is Jesus Christ. That the university is salt and light in our community. Father, I lift up uh, Gary Thomas to you to tonight. I thank you for the impact that he is having on relationships, marriages, families throughout America. And so, Father, as we come tonight and we listen to him, give us ears to hear, give us eyes to see, give us hearts to receive, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And thank you so much. And as uh, Charles said, is the uh, president this year uh, of the Guild and it is uh, such a, a privilege to be able, uh, on the one hand, to welcome all of you here, to welcome our guest speaker, Gary Thomas, and to express publicly our appreciation to the Lord for his ministry and the things that he has shared already today with our students and, and will share uh, tonight. But uh, my, my task is not, uh, my privilege is not uh, really to introduce uh, Gary uh, so much tonight, but... Uh, really to welcome you and then to express publicly the deep appreciation of Houston Baptist University for the Guild. Uh, the Guild has uh, in one, under one name or another been uh, the historic uh, organization to support the university and it has done so down through the years in numerous ways with many different projects in its earliest years uh, in, the, in the founding of the university, there were so many needs across the life of the university that uh, Dr. Hinton, I think whatever he thought we needed at the moment is, is uh, what the Guild would always step into support. So their financial support has been rich and real, and in, 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 recent, uh, uh, decade, in the recent decade, they have really focused upon, upon student scholarships. This particular uh, project, though, is one that is near and dear to the heart of the Guild, and it is devoted to students and to the community, but is, it is particularly focused on uh, the family. And so the Guild Institute in Christian Family Studies is now only in its third year, but we have the leadership uh, of the Guild uh, in recent years to thank for the founding uh, of this institute. Uh, Candy Britton is going to uh, introduce Gary Thomas, but I have to say that Candy was very instrumental uh, in the founding of uh, this lectureship and the institute uh, that, uh, that sponsors this lectureship, but it's the Guild uh, that's, that uh, really founded uh, the Institute itself. Candy, thank you so much for what you do and for what uh, you're doing this year and to so many uh, other leaders of the Guild uh, for their um, sponsoring, for their commitment uh, to HBU and to events like this. We feel like we have a tremendous 
uh, in reach to our own students. Convocation today was a tremendous example of that. And then, of course, outreach to our community. Candy Britton, thank you for all that you do, for all that you and Bill do. So come now, would you, and, and introduce Gary to us. Thank you so much, Dr. Sloan. And I am so glad you all are here tonight. And I want to echo what Charles has already uh, said as he praised Gary and uh, talked about what a wonderful uh, message we heard from him this morning. And I'd like to tell you just a little bit about our speaker, Gary Thomas. Gary is the founder and director of the Center for Evangelical Spirituality, a writing and speaking ministry that integrates scripture, church history, and the Christian classics. He has served as a campus pastor and is an adjunct faculty member at Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon. He graduated cum laude with a Bachelor of Arts degree in English Literature from Western Washington University. He holds a master's degree with a concentration in systematic theology theology from Regent College in Vancouver, British Columbia. And in 2006, he was awarded an honorary doctor of divinity from Western Seminary. Gary is the author of many, many books, and all of which encourage the building of Christ-centered family relationships. And some of his writings are Pure Pleasure, Authentic Faith, Sacred Marriage, Sacred Parenting, and Seeking the Face of God. And when he is not busy writing, he is an avid runner. And he told me today that he has now completed 11 marathons. He and his wife, Lisa, live in Houston, where Gary is the writer in residence at Second Baptist Church. And for the past several years... I have had the wonderful experience of being blessed by Gary's teachings at Second Baptist Church. His messages are always so clear, so insightful, so convicting, and I am just so pleased to welcome him now. Will you help me give him a warm HBU Guild welcome? Well, thank you. I am really excited to be here tonight. I've, I've spoken in some difficult circumstances on the West Coast one time. I was asked to speak on the pro-life issue to a very hostile audience. On the East Coast, I was asked to speak on the topic, is Jesus sexist? Uh, which is actually rather easy when you get into scriptures. There's not much defending that needs to be done, but it shows their bent. We're bringing a Christian and trying to defend how... Christians aren't sexist. Uh, I've been speaking at a church one time after a pastor had, had to step down and the church was facing a crisis. And I think of those moments where you're, you're, you're praying for God to show up because you know you might have some hostility or just some pain and some difficulties. But what makes me so excited about tonight is this is a lot of fun. The, the, there are times the gospel calls us to sacrifice, times the gospel calls us to surrender and there are times that it calls us to celebrate and to recognize the sheer goodness and generosity of God. And if we accept scripture as a whole, we have to preach on whatever it gives us. And so tonight when we were talking about what I would address and we settled on this, uh, it, it made me happy, if I could use that phrase, uh, to get to deliver a, a message that has been, uh, if, if I can say this, transformational in my own life. When I began to get this view of pleasure from, a, I believe, a biblical perspective, it really did change so many different areas of my life, which is what makes me so eager to be here this evening. So let's pray toward that end. Father, I ask for your gifting this evening. Lord, that by your Spirit, your Word could become alive, that truth would be showcased, that we could see a side of you that perhaps we, we haven't seen quite as clearly before, that false assumptions would go by the wayside. Lord, that we could be strengthened to, to leave here tonight as more vigorous worshipers. 
better able to withstand temptation, better equipped to have renewed relationships. Father, I thank you for pleasure and what you've created and the positive role it can have in our life. And I just ask that you would showcase that this evening, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My son is now 21 years old, finishing up his senior year of college. When he was just four years old, we were out on the East Coast flying back to Seattle. It's about a five-hour flight. Any of you mothers who have ever flown with a toddler know there aren't enough Cheerios in the world to keep a toddler quiet for five hours. So two-thirds of the way into the flight, we're, we're getting a little bit desperate, and I decided I just wanted to keep Graham distracted, so we got up and we're walking around the plane, finally settled right in the middle of the plane. There was a window there that I could lift him up and he could peer out, and we were just kind of standing around and talking. And then I noticed that the people in the section right in front of us all started tapping their, their earphones, and it looked kind of funny, and Graham and I were laughing a little bit about it. Finally, somebody hit a call attendant button and the flight attendant came up and she listened to him and she nodded her head, turned around, started walking directly toward my son and myself. And as soon as she saw us standing there, she got this look of disdain on her face. And I didn't know why she could be so frustrated with me, but she kind of pushed by. And, and then she explained, apparently there was this panel of very colorfully lit buttons right about at my son's height. They were right at, you know, Right, right there, and he had touched one of them, and apparently one of those buttons controls the audio for that section of the plane. And she admonished me for not keeping better watch of my son, but it wasn't enough for it to be private. She had to make it public, so she actually got on the intercom and said, I I'm so sorry, but uh, we had a child back here who hit a button and knocked out the audio in this section of the plane, so we have to rewind the movie to where it was when the audio went out, if you'll excuse us, but we want the people to be able to catch up. Well, unfortunately, they had started the movie a little bit late, so by restarting it, they didn't finish the movie by the time the plane landed. I was not the most popular passenger on the plane that day, as you might imagine, which somewhat explains my wife's response when we were getting off the plane. We had landed, we took up the whole middle row, it was pretty crowded, and, and Lisa said to me, Honey, you know, it, it's so crowded, we need to get out of here. Why don't you and Graham go down that aisle? I'll take the girls, and we'll go down this aisle, and we'll meet up at baggage claim. And I thought, well, I kind of understand why she's saying that. So I, I, I look at Graham and said, All right, bud, let's go. And he looks at me and goes, Daddy? I said, Yeah, bud. I think I'm going to go with Mom. <laughs> I said, Bud. You're the one that pushed the button. He goes, I know, Daddy, but you shouldn't have let me. You really shouldn't. <laughs> and, you know, I, I look back on that encounter, and I think he's right. There isn't a universe in existence where you place a four-year-old in front of a panel of colorly lit buttons, and he doesn't push one. If it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. He's going to push it. He can't not push the button. That's what four-year-old boys do. And you know what, if we're honest this evening, all of us as Christians have certain buttons in our life. There are these colorful buttons, they're flashing, and we know probably we, we shouldn't push them. We know there might be some negative consequences, but we would be very embarrassed to admit how much energy we expend trying not to push those buttons. I can't make the buttons completely go away in your life. That's more than God offers us through his word. But I do believe he's given us a tool that can help us face those buttons in our lives. It can help us step back from the buttons, maybe dim them a little bit and not, become, not let our life become about whether we push the buttons or not, but, but how we go on about our days enjoying the things that God has given us. And that tool is a biblical view of pleasure. A biblical view of pleasure. I want to ask you this question tonight. So often as Christians, when we come up to those issues, we think pleasure's the problem. What if pleasure isn't the problem? What if pleasure could be part of the solution? How could that be? Let me tell you about one of the first times I flew into Houston to give you a perspective on that. 
I came here directly from Seattle. It was in the middle of August. I had never experienced anything like Houston in August. You, you can't really describe it. I mean, you've all lived through it. It just, it just is, particularly when you come to Seattle and you might have a couple days a year when it reaches 80 degrees for about 90 minutes and then goes right back down. So I, w- I was speaking at two different churches. I spoke at one on Sunday morning and then was going to do a church retreat that began Sunday evening. And if I was going to get in my daily run, I'd have to run in the middle of the afternoon, which I wouldn't even think twice about doing in Seattle. So I, I put on my running clothes. It's about 3 p.m. in the middle of the August summer, in the middle of the day. The sun is high. I didn't bring any water with me because I would never carry water. I was just going to do a six-mile run. It's not, you know, I'm not going to get that thirsty. I thought I'd never carry water for six miles in Seattle, so I didn't think I would need that. And I stepped out, and I noticed I didn't see anybody else in Houston running in the middle of the afternoon, but I thought maybe you all just aren't into running or something like that. After about 15 minutes into my run, I couldn't believe how thirsty a guy could get in that amount of time. It felt like somebody had blown a hairdryer directly down my throat. I was that dry. After about 20 minutes, I passed a half-drunk bottle of Coke lying in a ditch and actually paused. (laughs) I'm thinking, "Ah, it's practically boiling. It looks really gross, but at least it's wet, and and I think I might need something. No, I can't do that, so I, I went on. After about half an hour, I thought, this, this could become life-threatening. I saw a woman in front of her house playing with her kids. They had a hose, and I walked up to her, and I said, look, I'm not from around here. I, I didn't realize how thirsty I'd get. Would, would you mind if I took a drink from your hose? She goes, oh, I, no, no, no problem at all. Go ahead. So I walk up to the hose. I'm, I'm trying to hurry because I'm a little bit embarrassed. I turn on the hose, put the hose up to my mouth, and inject the most plasticky tasting bacteria-encrusted water you could ever imagine. Who knows how long that water had been boiling inside that hose, and as it's coursing down my throat, there's this voice in the back of my mind saying, Gary, you are so going to regret this. Three hours from now, the gastrointestinal devastation you're inviting into your body is going to make you wish like you were dead. But you know what? I really didn't care I was so thirsty that I thought, even if I get really sick in three hours, I'll deal with it in three hours. I need to stop this thirst now. I'm so thirsty, I'll deal with the future. You could have put a group of scientists with a PowerPoint presentation right next to the hose with pictures of the bacteria in that hose and pictures of what I would look like. And if you, I really didn't care. I was that thirsty. I said, look, I've got to deal with my thirst. I'll deal with the consequences later. And it hit me that sometimes as Christians, we let ourselves get so spiritually thirsty that we're willing to drink any water that comes our way. It might be water that we know will make us sick. It might be water that our pastors and teachers and parents have warned us about. But if we're so thirsty, we don't care. We just need to take care of that thirst. And I could look back tonight on that day, that foolish afternoon, and I could fault myself for my lack of self-control. I could say, Gary, how could you drink something so gross? How could you actually even be tempted by a bottle of Coke lying in a ditch? I mean, that's repugnant. Where's your self-control? Where's your sense of discipline? Or more wisely, I think I can ask myself, Gary, why did you let yourself get into a situation where you were so thirsty, you were willing to do something that should be repellent to you or drink from something that should be repugnant? Why did you let yourself get into that kind of situation? And what I found that when we Christians are so suspicious of pleasure, when we view it as an enemy from Satan rather than as a gift from God, we often risk putting ourselves into situations where we are so thirsty, perhaps out of good intentions. We have run ourselves dry with work and service and responsibility and sometimes sacrifice, but we've left ourselves so vulnerable that it's like my son with that flashing button. It's only a matter of when, not if, that we push that button just to get relief. Well, why are we as believers suspicious of pleasure? 
Well, there are some scriptures that would lead us to seem to be suspicious of pleasure. I'd like to suggest tonight, though, that it's only the surface reading that would give us that view. Um, I want to give two examples of ones that, that make it so difficult for us as Christians to look at this the way I am. 1 John 2.15 is, is pretty clear. Do not love the world or anything in the world. That's such a stark statement, very clear. It doesn't seem like there's much to debate. And then James takes it a step further when he says, James 4, 4, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Well, who wants to be God's enemy? And, and if I just read these in isolation, my thought is I don't want to have anything to do with the world. I'm just going to sit in my room and, and pray and read the Bible. If I go out, it's only to share my faith. I, I don't really want to have anything to do with physical realities because, look, the world is bad. I'm not supposed to love the world. I'm not supposed to love anything in the world. And if I'm a friend with anything in the world, in a sense, that, that's hatred toward God. And, and I, I don't want to do that. But the challenge is that these aren't the only two verses, not only in the Bible, but in these books themselves. And the same John who wrote in his epistle, do not love the world, wrote in his gospel, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Now, why would James in his epistle say, do not love the world, when in his gospel he writes, God so loved the world. Now, being here at a Baptist university, there might be some Greek scholars. You might think, well, obviously, different Greek word is being used. It was translated the same way. So afterwards tonight, go home, look up, open up your Greek Bible. You're going to find out, in fact, it's the exact same word for world. It's cosmos. Actually, also the same word for love. But it's clear that John is using these words in two entirely different ways. In his gospel, he's speaking of the world that God created it. In fact, if I could replace it, I would use the word earth. It's, it's the earth as God created it, the way it was designed to be created, the way it's designed to be used. And in Genesis, we're told that God created the world and he called it what? Good. That this is a good world. It's clear in 1 John, he's referring to the world as the bent world as it is now. Systems that are in rebellion against God. A world that has been broken and twisted. So that it's not being used in the way God designed it to be used. Not being enjoyed the way that God designed it to be enjoyed. But in a sense, in rebellion against God. And, and so many pleasures of the world are this way. God says he gives us food not only to nurture us, but for our pleasure, but we can eat ourselves sick. We can eat ourselves into disease. He creates things like grapes that can be made wine that, that the Bible celebrates in some passages, but then in others it says, but make sure you don't get drunk. He created, we have things like money so that our needs can be met, but then we can become materialistic. And there, there are so many things where God created them that can be good, but then the world bends them and abuses them and twists them and perverts them uh, sexuality would be another classic case in point. And it's clear that in his epistle, John is saying, have nothing to do with the world that is in rebellion against God. And in his gospel, he's embracing a wonderful world that God created that reflects his good craftsmanship. And James does the same thing. The same James that wrote, friendship with the world is hatred toward God, also reminds us in 117 that every good and perfect gift it's from above, coming down from the Father. So the best way I think that we can handle this, if I can make sort of an arbitrary distinction, we need to learn how to enjoy the earth without loving the world. Does that make sense? I, I'm trying to use different words that the Bible would use the, the same words at, but I believe that's the accurate meaning. That the Bible would encourage us we can enjoy the earth as God created it, the things that God created for our enjoyment as good and perfect gifts from above. But we need to learn how to enjoy the earth without loving them in a way that is offensive to God or rebellious against the way that God instituted them to be used. And if we can do that, pleasure can become an enormous power for good in our lives. Something that can bless us and to turn us into great worshipers. The challenge is that we have taken condemnation of loving the world as condemnation of loving the earth 
Certainly the Gnostics took that to an extreme, and I think some Christians today take that to an extreme. Those that take it to an extreme really set up the world as almost this, this moral obstacle course that some sort of sadistic God created designed to see how strong our self-will is. That he's made a world full of temptations and pleasures only to see if we could not taste, not touch, not see, not experience. Another way I would put this is, do you see the world primarily as a prostitute or as a mother? It tells me a lot about how you view God and, and how you understand all of Scripture. Some Christians see this world primarily as a prostitute. It's just there to lure us away from everything that we know is right and true and, and is tempting us and trying to allure us. And, and yet some could see it as a good place that, that God has given to nurture our faith through which there can be life and health and enjoyment and laughter. Now, the challenge is that the Bible actually presents the world in both lights. At times, it can play the role of the harlot. At times, it can play the role of the nurturing mother. But those of us having been redeemed with God's spirit within us and God's word to guide us can begin more and more to see this world as a nurturing place that a good God created to bless us, to lead us to him, and to do some wonderful things in our lives. I mean, look at it from this perspective. H have you ever taken a step back and let yourself be amazed at how God has designed humans to experience pleasure? If God was anti-pleasure, if God had a problem with us experiencing even extreme pleasure, why did he design bodies that are so capable of experiencing such a varied form, such varied forms of pleasure? I mean, there's the pleasure of sight where some people go in and, and seeing art or majestic architecture or a, a beautiful canyon and we're just overwhelmed. There are some people that really get into the pleasure of auditory sounds, the, the music or conversation just just carries them away. They can pick up the melodies and the harmonies and it's just wonderful to them. Some people really enjoy the pleasures of touch. They, they enjoy the massage. They enjoy holding hands. There are people who enjoy um, the pleasures of taste, certainly. The, the, the foodies that really get into certain kinds of flavors and whatnot. And then there are the adrenaline pleasures. It's not really necessarily one of the senses, but you, you like the adrenaline rush or the intellectual pleasures. The crossword puzzlers or the Sudoku people and, and those kind of things. I mean, there, there are so many different kinds of pleasures that God has created. I believe by our design alone, it teaches us. Just from general revelation, looking at our bodies and this world as something that God created. This is a God who really has thought up many, many ways for us to enjoy ourselves. And yet so often as Christians, we deny God's good creation and we've set up this antagonistic view of God as if he really just created us with the capacity to enjoy pleasure to test us, to see if we could say no often enough. And, and that's why I think it's so important to have a biblical view of pleasure because I believe our view of pleasure directly flows from our view of God. And if we have an improper view of pleasure, a less than biblical view of pleasure, it flows from having a less than biblical view of God. It's so much more than what we enjoy. It has even more to do with who we relate to, and that is the God we were created to enjoy. The Bible, I believe, goes out of its way to counteract this view of God as an antagonistic God. Jesus certainly did this with his revolutionary statements in John 15, 15. When he says to a culture that was used to trying to appease the gods, he says, I, I no longer even call you servants. My first word for you, the, the first way I want you to relate to me and to think of me is as what? As friends. I call you my friends. Now, we're very familiar with this passage that may not seem so revolutionary to us, but, but think of this in the culture in which it was given. When centuries after, for centuries, People have been giving themselves over, trying to make the gods a little less angry. That's why they would cut themselves or 
sacrifice the virgins or, or even their firstborn children just trying to keep the wrath of the gods at bay. And here comes Jesus, God in the flesh saying, no, you, you, you got it all wrong. Because of me, the way you should think of me first is as your friend. And those who go far in the faith, who really carry the presence of God, have this sense of God as their truest friend. Paul says this in Romans 8, 31. The most powerful passages in Scripture, I believe, when he says, if God be, you know this, for us, who can be against us? Paul is so clear. We serve a God who is for us, not against us. Do you, do you live today with the sense that God is for you? Are, are you convinced, not just in your head, but in your heart, that, that God is on your side? He's there. I, I love how Calvin says this, after redemption, after we've been saved, God doesn't look at us as a judge, but as a physician. When something is wrong with us, he's treating us as a doctor would treat us, not as a judge to condemn us, but a physician to bring healing. That's the appropriate response of a child to our Heavenly Father. David, the, the one who messed up in so many ways and yet called a man after God's own heart, got this. Perhaps like few men. And maybe that's why God called him a man after his own heart. I think of in the Psalms when he wrote this in Psalm 35, 27. The Lord be exalted who delights in the well-being of his servant. David, the adulterer and murderer, the very arrogant man whose arrogance caused thousands of his fellow Israelites to be killed, still had this sense that, you know what, God doesn't just like me. He doesn't just accept me because he has to, because he's my God. He delights in me. Do you live with that sense? that God delights in you today? 2 Samuel twenty two twenty. David again speaking, God brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me. Why? David says, because he delighted in me. We could go on. We don't have time to go into more tonight on, on that end. But it's amazing to me with even just this scriptural witness that we still have believers who are more prone to pit the things of this world against God rather than seeing them as gifts from God, not rather than seeing them as things that God would delight to give to us for our enjoyment. They still see them as tests that God throws in our path. I remember speaking to a number of young moms on different occasions. They're so overwhelmed at the miracle of birth. They, they can't imagine what it's like to have a child until they actually have one. It releases in them emotions They've never experienced before. And, I, and I've heard several ask me this question, Gary, and with fear in their voices. Is it possible for me to love my baby more than I love God? And, well, I appreciate her heart, and, and I can assure her, look, God has given you a cure for that. It's called adolescence, all right? Just, just give it some time. I'm just joking, kids. I know we've got some adolescence in here, but... I, I appreciate her heart. I know it comes from good intentions, but my response is to question her premise. And I want to say, do you believe that God gave you this baby primarily as a test of your piety or as a good gift from his generous hands? Because that question really begins to put the whole nature of God into a particular light. Let me tell you what's going on in that new mom's life that really kind of illustrates all that we've been talking about. If you're to scope out the female brain or mom's brain when she's nursing her child, she is releasing all forms of oxytocin into her child and actually it's coming back from her child into her. Those are neurochemicals. It's a neurochemical. It creates loyalty and bonding and feelings of affection. And here's where I think God is so brilliant as a creator. Uh, young women have, have a free life, and, and it's not that it should be this way, but many of you women have told me this, that a lot of you grow up with it, you, you think your, your worth is directly tied to how you appear physically. 
you don't wish it was that way, but living in this world, you, you often feel that way. And so it would be easy to assume that a mother might begin to resent this intrusion into her life. Here's this child that begins to reshape her body and, and create marks and stretches and things that, that it will never go back to again. And, and then once that, that child is born, it's going to embarrass her in the store or in church or inconvenience her and then it's going to spit up on her and do other things on her and keep her up at night and make her tired and it's easy to assume that as much as you would think she would want her to love this child that she could soon resent this child because it's just blowing apart her life well god is not ignorant of this he, he created the mom he created the child and in his brilliance as the engineer of this world as the designer of the woman's body and as the designer of the baby he created the neurochemical called oxytocin so when the mother is nursing that child they're literally bonding together. They are neurochemically melting into each other because God designed it to be that way. And if you were to scope out her brain, it is as intense as romantic infatuation that she once felt for her husband, which is why it doesn't surprise me when I hear husbands, when they get really vulnerable, talk about how it feels like their wife is having an affair because she can almost feel like that kind of attraction toward her baby. And it's brilliant. Instead of her resenting that child, she's rebonding with that child many times a day. God created her brain to do that. So when she opens up First Chronicles and doesn't get the same neurochemical pop, it doesn't mean she's backsliding. It doesn't mean she doesn't love God's word or that she's warmed toward God rather than hot. It just means that God has given her a very intense physical reaction toward her baby because it makes sense that he would want her to be very rooted to this child for the sake of the child and for the sake of the family that's being created. So we could see it as a good, albeit very earthly thing, that accomplishes God's spiritual purposes. Let's go forward to another life situation where this is often pitted against each other. Um, singles will often hear these comments and it just irks me. As, as one who's a big fan of marriage, as you know if you were at Convocation today, but often they're, they're told by perhaps well-meaning preachers, well, the reason you're still single is clearly because you want to be married too much. And if you want to get married, you have to stop wanting to be married. And once it's no longer so important to you, then God will bring along your partner at just the right time. And I hear that, what kind of spiritual fakery is that? This antagonistic view of God that because I want something, God will withhold it. But once I can trick myself into no longer wanting it, then he's eager to give it. Okay, that's not the God that I see coming out of the scriptures here. And to those teachers, I would go back to the book of Genesis. I would go to the account of Adam when he walked with God in the most intimate way any human has next to our Lord himself, in a way that mystics could only dream about because Adam somehow could see God as clearly as you and I see each other. He could hear God as clearly as you hear my voice. He had a very direct and immediate relationship with his creator. Everything was provided. It was perfect. And in this very direct relationship with God, more immediate than we could imagine, in this time and in this age, it was God who came to Adam and said, Adam, I love this, you and me. It's working out great. But you know what? In my view, it's not good for you to be alone. Brothers and sisters, I didn't say that. Okay, this isn't my opinion that God wasn't enough for Adam. God said to Adam, Adam, I don't think this is good. This is not the complete divine intention I have for you. I want to give you someone that you can share this life with. Desiring to be married very deeply could be a surrender to how God created you. That yearning he put within your spirit. It's just as we talked about this morning, go about it in a way that honors God, in a way that can help you grow in God and build his kingdom and it's a very honorable desire to be aggressive and proactive about pursuing that relationship. Nothing you should be ashamed of. Here's a, a, another analogy that might help make this a little clearer. 
When my oldest daughter was a much younger girl, she fell in love with the American Girl dolls. Any of you women had, had those? I mean, ingenious marketing, right? You take a little bit of plastic, a little bit of stitching, throw some stuffing in there, and find a way to charge over $100 a doll, right? And, and they had, I don't know if they still do this, but they had these enormous 11 by 14 full color photographs, and then they would have the centerfold, so the dolls, and the, they're about... And Allison just fell in love with these dolls, and I was in ministry at the time. We had almost no money at all. I, I thought I could cut out some of the dolls, and I put them on cardboard with popsicle sticks, and so I gave her little American Girl doll popsicle dolls, and, and Allison is grateful enough that she played with them and seemed to enjoy them, but we knew she wanted more, and so we scrimped and we saved. Finally got enough to get Allison Samantha. And I'll never forget that Christmas. We put Samantha under the tree, Allison picked up the box, and of course I knew which box had Samantha in it, and I stopped what I was doing. And my eyes were riveted on my daughter as she began to unwrap that present, and she saw that it was Samantha, and she squealed, and she opens up the box, and she lets out her, you know, just yelps of delight. And, and, and I was transfixed watching my daughter, and as her dad, nothing gave me more pleasure than seeing my daughter really enjoy a gift I had given her. And throughout the rest of the day, as she played with Samantha and dressed her and put her down for a nap and then got her up from her rest and then sat her at the table and carried her around, I just delighted. I can't tell you a single thing I got that Christmas. I don't remember. I'll never forget the joy, the pleasure I had in giving her a gift that she really enjoyed. I wasn't threatened by her love of that doll. What would have bothered me was not her delight. I would have been bothered if she had had a religious response. If she had said to me, Daddy, I'm, I'm afraid you're going to think I love Jessica more, or Samantha more than I love you, so I'm just going to leave Samantha in her box and, and I'll just sit here and talk to you. I would have said, Honey, I paid over $100 for that doll. You're going to play with Samantha? You're going to enjoy her? Isn't the best way to thank the giver is to enjoy the gift. When you as a giver give something, does anything give you more pleasure than to see someone you've given a gift really and truly enjoy it? Maybe months later when you catch them enjoying this gift, doesn't that release a pleasure in you as a giver like nothing before? I, I didn't write pure pleasure just to help Christians enjoy pleasure. I, I wanted to give it as an offering to God hoping that we would enjoy the gift. How many of us are denying our Heavenly Father tremendous pleasure because he, 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 he sprinkled these gifts all at our feet. And out of our religious piety, we refuse them, viewing them as tests of our faith rather than as good and generous gifts that God would help us embrace. But it's that religious piety that keeps us from giving God that pleasure because there's still something within us as believers where if it's not religious, we're suspicious of it. One of my, uh, an author I greatly admire, and I will keep reading his books, and I want to give his name because I want you to read his books, and I don't want to get in a public feud because I've been so helped by what he said, but I remember one passage that just stopped me short. He was talking about men with empty souls who do things like have affairs or run marathons. I'm, like, I, I'm an adulterer now? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I guess running marathons are, is a very earthy thing to do. I mean, I sweat, I get dirty, it takes time. But here's the reality. If you were to talk to my wife, I think she would tell you I'm a much better husband when I'm running. I know because when I get injured, she's the one that's kind of wanting to push me out the door. I, are you sure that leg's not better? I mean, I, I, I think I'm far more cranky. I don't process stress as well. I, I just don't handle irritable. I be, think I've become more irritable. And, and if I was the ideal man, maybe I could spend eight hours in my room just studying and praying and meditating. But I'm not the ideal man. And I think it's better to recognize my weakness, recognize my propensity to sin, and say, God has given me a very earthly gift that in many ways is a healthy way to process stress that can help keep this body moving and, and actually help me become a better husband. 
And I think if I tried to do without this earthly gift, I would be dishonoring God because obviously I don't do as well without it. Now, if in God's providence he takes it away, which he could strike my knees, you know, any number of ailments, but as long as he allows it, I believe it's a good gift that I should embrace and worship him for it. It, it, it comes down to this. Who am I trying to oppress? James 3, 2 says, we all stumble in many ways. My piety will never impress God and, and not impress many people, quite frankly. And, and I, so I could, I, I could try to present this ideal Gary who, who doesn't need holy pleasures to function in a way that honors God. But I believe if I do that, I'll risk like becoming that runner I was in Houston when I became so thirsty, I was willing to drink any water that perhaps even Satan might put in my path. I know from personal experience, if I don't manage healthy pleasures well, unhealthy pleasures gain a whole new sense of urgency and temptation for me. When my life is filled with good things, I'm much less vulnerable to eating from things that aren't healthy. So while I am very grateful for the religious pleasures, I take great delight in reading God's word, in studying the Christian classics, in prayer, going to the Lord. I'm also thankful that after a long weekend of ministry, I can go on those long runs through the woods or laugh with friends, just the physical relief of laughter or, or watch some incredible athletic contests on television to deal with stress that way. When I was going through high school, there were any number of guys on a circuit that were making a very good living getting us teenagers to burn our records. That was when you have these big bonfires, burn your records, and some of them, quite frankly, I'm glad I burned few I wish I could have back. Um, and in fact, when I look at the secondhand market for some of those, I could probably pay off some college debts for my kids with that. But, but that, that's another thing. But I, I, I look at it differently because there was a time in my life, probably a good decade, where I wouldn't listen to a song unless it was telling me I was converted or trying to convert me or reminding me that I was converted. And while I appreciate those, I will be a Keith Green man for the rest of my life. I look at it very differently. Because I realize now that, you know what, the whole concept of hearing is something that God, comes from God's engineering mind. The idea that there should be something like music, God came up with. Harmony and melody and beat and putting it together. Not only did God create music, but he created people who are so gifted at putting that together that it's just amazing that after a long weekend of ministry, I can put the earbuds in my ear, turn on the iPod to shuffle, and sometimes the perfect song comes on and my soul opens up to God just saying thank you Lord for the gift of music this is exactly what I need I, I can't explain why because I'm not very musical but when it's the right kind of music it doesn't just tickle your ears sometimes it really does to borrow David's phrase restore your soul and so what that has done is it's released to me a whole new avenue of worship that I worship God for the things of this world that are here by his creation and by his design. So rather than pulling me away from God, the things of this world have led me to God with a whole new emphasis of worship. My theological mentor, Dr. J.I. Packer, for whom I'll always be indebted, said this, contempt for pleasure so far from arguing superior spirituality, is actually the sin of pride. Pleasure is divinely designed to raise our sense of God's goodness, deepen our gratitude to him, and strengthen our hope of richer pleasures to come in the next world. So what does this mean for us? How do we put this together? Well, let's say you're a stay-at-home mom. You have given yourself over to your family. You're denying yourself to serve your husband, to serve your kids. Or maybe you were a working mom and you're even more stressed out because now you've, you've got to earn a paycheck and then you come home and then you've got all those other duties. And, and, and one evening you're on Facebook to catch up with some friends 
It's late in the night. You know you're only going to get about six hours of sleep, but you want to check in. And then you notice there's this friend request. And it's from one of those boyfriends that you know you have no business connecting with. And if you were in a better place in your life, you would have just laughed it off, put ignore and move on, and you wouldn't have even paused. But you're horrified because your finger's hovering over the accept button. And you're thinking to yourself, you know, I, I wonder what he's doing now. I wonder what he looks like. You know, we did have some good times. At a better time in your life, the thought of reconnect would have been repugnant to you, but now it's a roaring temptation. And you can fight your whole sense of self-control and self-discipline, but I would ask a wiser question, why did you let yourself get into a situation where you're so spiritually thirsty, something that should be repugnant to you is now very inviting? Because if it's not this guy, it'll be someone else. That temptation marks a gap in your life that isn't met just with iron will discipline, but sometimes with learning to embrace the good things so that you have a fuller soul that's less susceptible to that. You know, I think in my generation, one of the things that we tend to look down on is just video games, and I certainly think video games can be way overdone. But I changed my view a little bit when I heard this story, a true story of a professional baseball player, a pitcher, really hot prospect going into the major leagues. He was married, a believer, but he knew the life of a baseball player, particularly a pitcher, could be pretty rough. You only have to play one out of every five days. You have a lot of money, and there are a lot of groupies that would like to be with the baseball player even for one night. He didn't want to have the temptations that would pull him away from his wife or that would challenge his integrity as he walked before God. He knew if he went out with his teammates clubbing and nightclubbing, it could get really bad. So that's when he developed his love for video games because he wanted something he could look forward to in his hotel room that wouldn't destroy his life. And upon retirement, he's been working to to build a video game that he'll be marketing soon. But I respect a man who recognizes his weakness. He says, this is where I'm weak. This is a vulnerability. Is there a healthy pleasure? something that will at least not dishonor God that I can look forward to because I know if it's just about am I going to have fun or not fun, I'm likely to go there one too many times. And so very practically, if you find yourself falling into the same pit time after time after time and all you're berating yourself for is your lack of self-discipline, might it not be that you need to take a step back and say, am I so thirsty Have I had an unbiblical view of pleasure that I'm setting myself up for fall after fall after fall? It was Paul himself who said the rules, do not taste, do not touch, hold no power for righteousness. When we begin to see pleasure as a friend, not as an enemy, it has a huge impact on our families as well. And that's a big focus of the guild. So right before I end here, I want to mention that. As one who's talked to tens of thousands of couples, I believe many marriages begin to fail primarily when they become utilitarian. It is so easy in the rush of life for marriage to be about making sure the kids are fed and cleaned and not bleeding and the mortgage is paid and the floor doesn't have any communicable diseases on it and, and, and all of the tasks have to be done and they just stop enjoying each other. And the marriage breaks down. I believe this because I've seen a statistic that 87% of men who cheat on their wives want to go back after the affair is over. Nine out of ten wake up and say, I made the biggest mistake of my life. And what that tells me is the problem wasn't the initial matching. It's probably a life situation where the marriage became so utilitarian. They went into an affair that's only about pleasure, those stolen moments affirming each other. It's all about getting together and having fun. But then when that dies down, they realize, you know, I made a huge mistake. And I want to tell men, you know what? Put that same effort that you were throwing into that affair or would throw into an affair. Inject pleasure into your marriage and protect your kid's home instead of letting it be threatened. Because you can survive on the fumes of dating for a while. But the way God made us, marriages devoid of pleasure become very thirsty. 
And very thirsty people often will drink polluted water. And it's the same thing with our parenting relationships. Because parenting is so important, we want our kids to get the right education. We want them to get to know the Lord. We want them to be uh, suitably employed. They start to feel like projects. And, and so when we treat them like projects, when we're forgetting to just enjoy times, when, when we try to make every life moment a teaching moment instead of just laugh about it and, and be in the moment, they start to treat us like projects. Then we're just ATM machines or taxi drivers. You know, Mom, Dad, just get me there and hand over the money and don't ask me any questions. But enjoying times of pleasure, cultivating times of pleasure, being intentional about enjoying times together create the very background we need for the times of discipline and training that God would call us to. It comes down to this, and I'll, and I'll end with this. When I first started coming to Second Baptist uh, a number of years ago, uh, one of the pastors there on staff, Ben Young, is just about my age. He's about a year younger than me, but he looks a lot younger than me. He's got the hair, uh, he surfs, he can wear designer t-shirts and tear it off. Uh, and my son was mesmerized by Ben because Ben was teaching him how to surf and he just thinks Ben is so cool and in comparison his dad is so old. And Ben knows how to dress. And he would see me come into Houston. He said, Gear, I know you're on these stages and I know you're in these conferences and you, 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 your clothes really don't fit. And, and you know, my wife had been talking to me about this for years, but he said, you know, for... A runner guy and whatnot, you need to get this kind of shirt. And he talked about certain jeans that I'd, I'd never heard about before. And he said, but just, just, just try them. And I did, and my wife actually really liked the results. And I liked the fact that my wife liked the results instead of just shaking her head when I came out to be, to be dressed for the day. And um, I, I remember trying to impress my son because Ben actually sent me one of those T-shirts that he wore. In fact, we had a picture of Ben with his family, and he's wearing this T-shirt. It was on our refrigerator back up in Washington State. My son was still in high school at the time. He was in the kitchen doing his homework, and I thought I'd impress Graham, so I put on the T-shirt. I went downstairs, and I nudged Graham, and I, I pointed at the picture on the photograph on the, on the refrigerator. I said, hey, Graham, and I pointed at my chest. Ben Young wears this shirt. And Graham looked at me, and I looked at the photograph, and he said, with the disdain that only a 17-year-old can muster, said, maybe so, but I guarantee you, he doesn't tuck his in. I thought, he got me on that. But what Ben taught me about shopping is that basically 90% of the stores don't make clothes that fit me. He said, Gary, you don't even have to go there. Modern fit, he goes, that's chubby fit. I mean, he just, he just, he just went on, he just said, y y those, those are... And not being a particular fan of shopping, I actually like that. I, there are just a fewer places I go. It, it's, it's more efficient, and they fit. And, and I look at pleasure that way. This world is filled with cheap pleasures that don't fit your soul. They might seem cheaper, but they don't fit the way that God made you to live. And we need to go to Jesus and say, here's how I designed you. Here are the pleasures that build you up, that nourish you, that create relationship rather than destroy relationship, that release worship instead of take you to a time of repentance. And, and I think much of life is about learning to embrace the pleasure that leads to worship so that we don't have to embrace the pleasure that leads to repentance. Pleasure is going to take us to one of the other places. And, and the challenge I found is that some of you, you don't want to wear any pleasures at all. You want to walk around naked. We don't want to see you naked. We need godly pleasures to be active worshipers, to be strengthened against temptation, to restore our relationships as husbands and wives, as parents and children. Pleasure is a good thing designed by a very creative God. We can embrace it in a way that honors him. Let's pray. Lord, we do recognize you as a very able and good and creative designer. Lord, I pray where I've spoken truth that your spirit would accent it, 
underline it, emphasize it, and help us apply it in our daily lives. If I have not represented your word, I pray you would make it very clear to every mind here. But I pray, Lord, that we could be released to worship you more, to be strengthened against those temptations, and to have our relationships restored through a use of pleasure that honors you as the creator of pleasure, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.